Genesis chapter 4, starting in verse 1. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the first things of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel, unto Abel and his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell as well. Well, we praise you again for this day, Lord, for this time we have together tonight, for your word is just opened in front of us. We pray, Lord, your blessings on us. We pray, Lord, that uh, as your spirit moves in our heart, we would be faithful and obedient to everything it leads us to do. We pray, Lord, that we would be found uh, uh, giving offerings to you that you had respect of, Lord, that we would give you our very best, and that, Lord, in turn, we would do that because of our worship and love for you and because of what you are and what you mean to us. Well, we pray that as we lift you up, you draw all men to you, Lord, that uh, your will would be done. We pray especially again for this upcoming week, Lord, as we uh, attempt to shower the gospel upon the young folks uh, in our families and in our community, Lord, that you would bless every effort and that we would see fruit of that labor. Well, we love you, we praise you, we thank you all in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm not going to go along tonight. I know we got some teachers and stuff still wanting to get things ready for Bible school. Uh, but I wanted to move into this, this next chapter in Genesis. We finished off with, with, uh, with Genesis 3 and with Adam and Eve being driven out of the Garden of Eden. And uh, now we move into chapter 4 and we get a lot of firsts. We're going to have uh, the, the first pregnancy. We're going to have the, the first child. Therefore, making the first mother and the first father. So, Father's Day here this evening, we're going to talk about a little bit uh, uh, Adam becoming the first father. Uh, we're going to see the first offering that's given up, uh, not a sacrificial uh, blood offering as we've already seen, but uh, uh, the first offering, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what makes that different in a minute. And we're going to see the first murder, as we'll see the first uh, uh, death take place, human death, as as uh, Cain kills his brother. Quickly tonight, this is the thought I wanted to go with it, and, and I'll move into a little bit about this coming week. You ever wonder or think maybe why in these verses God respected Abel's offering and God did not respect Cain's offering? Um, I mean, they both gave something to the Lord, right? They both gave, they both gave of what they did. Uh, the Bible said Cain was a tiller of the ground. So he gave a, a, of the ground that he tilled and that, that Abel was uh, a keeper of the sheep and he, he gave of what he did. So, so they gave of what they did. Why did God respect one and not respect the other? So I want to think about that for just a quick minute tonight. I think uh, for many years, I kind of thought of it this way. I kind of really thought, well, you know, maybe it was because uh, there was bloodshed. Maybe it was because, like, uh, the sin offering that had just taken place uh, uh, as God made coats for them to, to cover their nakedness and their shame. And we know that the Bible is clear, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. So maybe it was because there was a, uh, a sacrifice, a blood sacrifice with Abel's, uh, that maybe that's why God respected it and that there was just something from the ground, just a, a grain offering that was given by Cain and maybe that's why he didn't. And that might sound good, but when you start kind of studying and looking at it, 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 it it's really not that goes a, a lot deeper. We, we first thing I look up is that, that word offering. Uh, in the original Hebrew language uh, it was Minka. And it was it had nothing to do with the sin offering. This was not something given uh, in respect of a reconciliation for a sin that had been committed. Uh, all out through the Old Testament, as that word gets used, it, it means a gift given to someone of importance, most of the time an important king. It's something that was brought as a gift, brought as 
the purpose of recognizing that, that this person is important, this person is a king, and this is why we want to give it. And so we kind of see that, that that's what we have here. We, you know, we got the first family, we got the first two children of the family. Uh, they haven't been long out of, out of Eden, and, and I'm quite sure as they grew up, they heard the story after story after story uh, about how God had blessed them and how God had given them dominion over everything. And, you know, I'm quite sure Adam, but every, every once in a while I go, you know, that's a horse. You know why it's a horse? Because I named the horse. Because God let me name it. You know, that kind of stuff. But but they understood. I'm quite sure that the, the sons understood the importance of God and who God was. And there's still communication here with God as we see this take place with Cain. And so their idea of a, of a sovereign God, of a powerful God, of a God that they owe loyalty to, a God that they owe worship and praise to, it's not something new. They they understand it. They, they've got it. And so here they, they both come and they truly offer something to God. Not a sacrifice, but an offering. I'm going to give you something. Cain of the ground, what he'd grown, able of his flock of sheep given to God. So, so what's the difference? When you, when you look at those verses, what makes the difference? Because when they give them, it's clear. God respects Abel's. God does not respect Cain's. And I want you to consider something out of, out of verse 3. Brian, would you go back to verse 3? Old King James Version puts it this way. And in process of time, it came to pass. You, if you have a different translation, most of the other translations say, and in the course of time. In the original language and how it lays out it, it really kind of means this. It really kind of means at the end of days. So after a period of time, after a course of time, in the process of time it came to pass, at the end of days. And now you got to think a little bit about what Cain brings. He brings something that he's grown. He brings something from the ground. He, he brings a grain offering. But as it notices here, it, it, he, it's not what he brings that causes the issue. It's not what he brings that has God reject him. And it's not what Abel brings that maybe causes God to accept it and respect it. It's the, it's the time period. You say, well, you know, he had to wait for it to, to grow and have the harvest. But it's that idea of at the end of harvest. At the ending, when everything was finished, and then you get the 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 wording from uh, the next verse of verse four, and Abel he also brought of the what firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. It's that time period. It's that idea that Abel brought the first. And Cain brought what was left at the end. And this becomes a principle of God dealing with Israel and God all together from here on out. <laughs> that idea of, of first. That idea of being something first. Abel gave first. Cain gave at the end. God wants our first in everything. He don't want our last. He don't want our leftovers. He don't want us to pick and choose and figure out, let's give what the Lord what we got left. But he wants to be first. I'm going to read a couple of quick passages. Uh, Brock, would you go to Numbers 18 and verse 12? We're going to read several verses that all fall right together there in Numbers 18 and verse 12. Old Testament says here, all the best of the oil and all the best of the wine and of the wheat, the first fruits of them they shall offer unto the Lord. Them have I given thee. Then he continued, verse 13, and whatsoever is first ripe in the land which they shall bring unto the Lord shall be thine. Everyone that is clean in thine house shall eat of it. Verse 14, everything devoted in Israel shall be thine. Verse 15, Everything that openeth the matrix in all flesh, which they bring unto the Lord, whether it be of men or beasts, shall be thine. Nevertheless, the firstborn of man shalt thou surely redeem, and the firstling of unclean beasts shalt thou redeem. Verse 16. 
And those that are to be redeemed from a month old shall thou redeem according to thine estimation for the money of five shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary, which is 20 garas. And then get read that kind of crazy verse to get to verse 17. But the firstling of a cow or the firstling of a sheep or the firstling of a goat thou shalt not redeem. They are holy. Thou shalt sprinkle their blood upon the altar, and thou shalt turn their fat for an offering made by fire for a sweet savor unto the Lord. As Israel becomes a nation and Israel becomes a people, God lays this out through Moses as, as the law. God wants the first. God demands to have the first. Uh, as we lay out the law, uh, Brian, would you go to Leviticus 23? Verse 9 and 10. Leviticus 23, verses 9 and 10. Takes a minute to spell out Leviticus, doesn't it? I could have picked Joel, couldn't I? That'd been easier. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, verse 10. Speak of the ch uh, children of Israel and say unto them, When ye be come into the land which I give you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then shall ye bring a sheep of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. Lay it out in law. The first. I want some of the fur, the very first thing. And then one more. Let's go to what Solomon would say in Proverbs 3, verse 9. Pro Proverbs 3, verse 9. Nine. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. Even when you got down into Israel's form of taxation and they're making sure that they took care of the country and took care of the, the temple and the priests and they enacted the, the tithes. Tithes were 10%. It was the first 10%. You gave the first 10% of everything, the first 10% of the green beans you grew, the first 10% of the sheep that you raised, the first 10% of the money that you made. It was always the first. You gave God the first. Abel gave God his first. Cain did not give his first. Making God first is a priority. It's a priority laid out by God. It's a priority that we should be living out, sustaining, agreeing with, and teaching our kids that God gets the first. And God is first. Amen? Amen. Well, this week we get a chance to teach our children. This week we get a chance to teach neighbors' children. Who's our neighbor? We're going to find out who our neighbors are this week, hopefully. We'll get some neighboring children. And we're going to get a chance to, to teach them and we should not just teach them this week, but teach them all the time, whatever we do or wherever we're at, teaching them that God gets first. God's the priority. God is who we worship. It's all about God. We should be modeling it in our lives. Our children, not just our biological children, but our kids in the church should be looking up at the adults and seeing us model these things. We, we want this week to cultivate a, a love for Jesus. We want this week to, to build worship into their lives. We want them to, to see. We want our children to worship. We want to build that in them. We want to build a love for this house in them. And we have to model that ourselves. Again, it's easy for us to say when we're sitting here on a Sunday night. But to build that in, to model that, to see that our children see that we put the Lord first. I never understood why I was, when I was young why my mama made me go to every church service. I just didn't understand that. I couldn't figure out why we went on Sunday morning and Sunday night. I mean, we got it on Sunday morning, why don't we go back on Sunday night? And we went on Wednesday night. And first of revival, we went every night. First of singing, we went. If everybody had to get together and fix the toilet, we're going to be there. Everybody, church doors is open. Sue Hannah's taking Tommy Hannah, and we're going to church. And I, I learned to love church, but I didn't quite understand it. 
when I was young, before I was saved, before I began to have that love of Jesus cultivated in my life, and I've shared this before, the one that really bothered me, why on the night of the Super Bowl I got to go to church? It's the Super Bowl. Why was just one night? Can I stay home one night? Nope. We're going to church. Because my mom and all her faults, one thing for sure, she modeled that church was important. We're going to be at church. We're not going to miss nothing that happens at church. And my mom was just wise enough. I think she watched me. She studied me. She knew me. And she finally got to the point where she thought that that love and, and, and my worship had cultivated to the point to finally one Super Bowl Sunday night. She said, hey, you can stay home if you want to watch the Super Bowl. I said, no, I'm going to church. Now, the year before that, I said, oh, thanks, Mom. And I'd have stayed home and I'd have watched it. But I had finally got to that spiritually mature point to where I wanted to be at church. I loved church. I didn't want to miss church. And so when she said, hey, you can stay home tonight, that little grin she had, I'm like, no, Mom, I'm going, I'm going to church. I never watched another Super Bowl Sunday after that, other than watching when I got home, DVRs came along, I had to DVR one every now and then. But it was just that modeling of what's of first importance? What's the priority? What are we teaching our kids is of first importance? The very first thing, Genesis 4, God said, I like your offering. Abel, because you gave me up the first. Cain, I have no respect for your offering, because you gave me what was leftovers. A principle that will follow its way all the way through. I hope this week we can cultivate a worship among our kids. Show them how important worship really is. To, to be a worshiper. Because here's the thing. God built in us the idea of worship. He wired us to worship. The question is not, are you going to worship something or not worship something? The question is not, do we worship or not worship? The question is, what do we worship? Because we're going to worship something. Everybody worships something. Are we going to worship the creator? Or are we going to worship something he created? Paul lays it out that way in Romans chapter 1, and I want to end with that tonight. Brock, would you go to Romans 1 and verse, we'll start with verse 16. Romans 1, 16. Paul says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Well, we saw that today. We've been seeing that as, as he's making his way through all those cities in the area of Galatia. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, as we've seen it play out. Verse 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it's written, the just shall live by faith. Verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Verse 19. <coughs> Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. Verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead, so that they are without excuse. God placed it within man to know that there is a God, and there is a right way, and there is a wrong way, and there is a good, and there is an evil. God put it in the hearts of every man. Verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. I want you to listen to these next few verses. We talked about this morning, what a bad shape our country's in. Romans 1 outlines exactly why we're at and where we're at in this country that used to be so great. Their foolish heart was darkened. Verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Verse 23. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and the birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Verse 24. 
Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness. This is us, though. This is where we find ourselves as a people today. Through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Don't stop there. We'll come back to that verse. Verse 26. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural, their, uh, the natural use into that which is against nature. We live in it out. Verse 27. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. God gave us up to our own lust and sinfulness, and that's what it turns into. Verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, Boy, that's where we find our country. Don't talk about God. Take everything about God out. Take religion out. Take judgment out. Take sin out. Do what you want to do. If it, make it, if it feels good, you do. God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Verse 29. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, verse 30, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. You know what we celebrate this month, right? What the world celebrate, what the United States is celebrating. Romans 1. It's what they're celebrating. What a shame. We say, well, you know, all that stuff and all that sinfulness and, and all that evil, I sure am glad I, I live in Shannon. <laughs> Folks, it's here too. Very reputable news outlet, at least in my mind. I like Fox News. Fox News ran an article. I read it to Valerie today. Just came out. Five most dangerous cities as far as crime and what happens to you in the United States. Number two was Memphis, Tennessee. Number three was St. Louis, Missouri. Number four was Detroit, Michigan. Number one was Bessemer, Alabama. And number five was Birmingham, Alabama. We made two of the top five. That'd be great if Satan was still coaching. We're talking about football. That ain't good in that book. It's all around us. It's everywhere we turn. And it's all Romans 1. But it spurs out of one thing. Brock, would you go back to 25? We'll end with there. Who changed the truth of God into a lie. That said, this doesn't mean anything. This isn't right. This is a bunch of fables. This is just a big story. You're crazy if you believe what this is. Change the truth of God into a lie. And then that phrase, worship and serve the creature or the creation or something that was created instead of or more than God, capital C, creator who created it. This week, my prayer is, and I hope your golden prayer is, that we teach our kids the importance of worshiping the one true God. The importance of cultivating a love for Jesus Christ, the only way to be saved. And that we make that our first priority. That becomes our first fruit. That we give God our very best and we model and show and teach our kids that that's what's important. The creation's not important. The creator is who's important. And in today's society, that's hard because that's not what they're being taught. That's not what they're being shown. That's not what they're seeing on TV. And hey, listen, kids don't even watch TV anymore. That's not what they're seeing on their phones. 
That's not what they're seeing in their videos. That's not what TikTok is showing. That's not what they're getting. The only place they're going to get it is from us. The only place they're going to hear it and see it is from us. So we start it. We, we make sure we, we cultivate it this week, but we don't end it with this week. And we show them the importance of the first priority being the Lord. He doesn't take second seat, second fiddle to anything else. Amen? Amen. Let's stand. Have a verse of invitation and then I kind of like for tonight to close out the service in the altar with an altar prayer for for our teachers and for Megan and for all that has a part in, in the Bible school and for everybody that attends it. So let's have a verse of invitation and then we'll just see if uh, uh, anybody else will come join us there. ourselves, Lord, from the things, Lord, the, the sins so, so easily beset us. You know our hearts. You know us better than we know ourselves. I pray, Lord, that we look unto you for, for the guidance and the leadership that we so desperately need. We need it individually, we need it within our families. We need it within our country. I ask you, Lord, that this week, Lord, as we enter into this time of Bible school, we look to you for this guidance and this leadership. We look to we look for each child that comes. And we just we see them, Lord, as your creation. We see them, Lord, as a, as kids that some child is lost. It doesn't know you. And we look for an opportunity, Lord, to share one word or, or words, Lord, that maybe change their life concerning their, their faith. Their acceptance of you. For we all know, Lord, that salvation is only had through Jesus Christ. Amen. And we know, Lord, that the world's not teaching Jesus. The name of Jesus is going to be heard. It's going to be in the families. It's going to be in the homes. It's going to be at church. I don't know of any other place. So I ask you, Lord, this week, these, when these doors are open, Lord, they'd be seen as a safe and stable in their year. They'd be seen as a place of hope. 
You can see on self going as missionaries are going to feel that they need those seeds go maybe even harvest them. Amen. I think go to the word that was shed tonight. Go to the word of this morning and know the Lord that your words are true. I ask the Lord that we be up light on the hilltop. Someone may see Jesus in our life. I just thank you, Lord, for this church, for this people. For I know what we have to concern is young people. They have a concern for the loss of their families. They have a concern one for another. So I ask you, Lord, shower us with the gospel this week. Amen. May your word just, just, just cover us. So there would be no doubt that you're here. Holy Spirit, Lord, just to intervene with us, around us. When we leave this week, Lord, and each night, we'll know that your work's been done. We can know, Lord, that you're satisfied with what you won't be like the way we want you. What we do to be accepted. Amen. So I thank you, Lord, for these people. And I ask you, Lord, to bless their work. May we see much harvest. Much done this week. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.